how would you like to hear from the person who taught some Aboriginal memory techniques as part of a recent study, a scientific experiment that went global and viral and suggests that the techniques he showed a group of students perform better than ye old method of loci? Well, I wanted to hear more about this too, so let me introduce you to Dr. Tyson Yonkaporta, who before we sat down for this interview told me by email that he loves the Aboriginal memory techniques, but also still likes the memory palace technique. In fact, he likes them a little more than just liking them. As he wrote, I'm a huge Hannibal Lecter superfan, so I'm also inevitably a fanboy of the memory palace technique. The idea of putting this in a bucket with an aboriginal technique and making them fight to the death is just anathema to me. Well, it's anathema to me as well. And what a great way to set the stage for taking a deep dive into the real deal behind what memory improvement really means and what it can become for you as the serious practitioner of all the global and historical memory arts you can find. Practitioner, student, and someone who constantly expands your context. Now, Tyson is the author of an incredible book called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. I highly recommend you read it, and in this interview, you'll see that I use one of the memory techniques he teaches in this book. I had never known to use memory techniques in quite this way, and the experience I had with the exercise he gives in Sand Talk was unique, powerful, and ultimately led to much more interesting questions I wanted to ask during this yarn. I think it would have been very different otherwise, and this is part of the strength of actually reading and implementing what you read. And yarning is a very interesting term that Tyson uses, so I again encourage you to check out Sand Talk. Now, if you missed the previous discussion with Dr. David Reeser about the scientific study that Tyson was involved in, please check out that previous video. And I'll also have a link below to a discussion called Memory Wars between Tyson and David that you'll probably also find useful. Not that they had a memory war between each other, that is. They were referring to some of what happened after this study went viral all over the globe. Now, in this interview, Tyson treats you to a list of tools for learning that supplement the notions of space that structure things like song lines. And you're going to want to be ready to write that list down and prepare to follow up with more research of your own so you can appreciate these tools in context and bring them into your own context. Now, I'm using this word context because it's very, very important in this regard. It's important in sand talk and it's important to the implications of how you expand your skills as a user of memory techniques. So please reflect on its meaning and plan to widen your own context for best results. Now, speaking of plans, the plans I was telling Tyson about near the end of this interview will hopefully still come to fruition. And I heard what he said to me loud and clear at the end. But if I seem a bit confused and things appear to come to an abrupt end at the end of this interview, that's only because there was a bit of a technical glitch that chewed up some of our time. I have a feeling, though, that this is just the beginning of a great series of conversations and future initiatives. And if you'd like to see those things happen, please let us know in the comments. And as always, get subscribed if you're new here, share this video around so more people can join us, and for the love of memory, hit that worldly thumbs up so that our robot overlords never forget that humans still care about all the world's great memory traditions. As Tyson talks about both in this book and this interview, not making one technique fight to the death with another is so important. And not making things fight is maybe one of the secret weapons of the true warrior of the mind. Unless, of course, you're willing to take all the wounds that you gave the other. Now, only by focusing on context can we respect, connect, reflect, and direct these great traditions forward with lasting success. And I am very, very grateful to Tyson for teaching me about these things. So I'm also grateful to you too for being part of this initiative. And everyone on Team Magnetic appreciates it very much. So without further ado, please enjoy this discussion with Dr. Tyson Yonkaporta. Tyson, thanks so much for joining me to discuss memory and the background that you have with this, the study that came out and just by way of introduction for people who don't know about your work or Sand Talk, the book, you know, who is Tyson Yonkaporta? And uh, also, what 
do you mean when we had a little bit of an email exchange and you know you said I'm a Memory Palace fanboy still and you know let's put an end to oh, this yeah. sort of <laughs> you know whatever territorializing or this is better than that kind of thing because I thought that was the most no it was just uh, that that study it just surprised me that anybody read it it was it, it was from like three years ago I don't know someone's decided to like dust it off you know what I mean like uh, nobody even wanted to publish it before we couldn't get any funding for it you know yeah. um, no one's ever been interested in it but all of us I think someone just saw potential clickbait and I don't know some someone out there wants to start another culture war and and they just want to sort of throw some fuel on that and so they put it out, you know, Aborigines defeat the ancient Greeks. The West is rubbish, you know, right, right. <laughs> uh, you know, just to sort of, I don't know, get a few people excited and hot under the collar. I, I don't think anyone's biting, though. No one serious. Like even Jordan Peterson, he I think he put a positive tweet about it. Someone told me. Oh, really? You know, okay. he, he was he was just like, you know, his response was, well, you see how important uh, narrative is for uh, human cognition, you know, which is, I don't know, a fair takeaway. Right, right. He, he didn't feel like he had to defend the West or anything. So, you know, if Jordan's not jumping on board, then, um, then nobody else should either. Right, right. <laughs> now, that's an interesting way to put it because I don't even – see it as a western thing memory you know uh or even if it were the greek tradition what would be west about the greek well that, that that's just it what what is west <laughs> about, but but uh, i think basically a lot of the culture warriors from the anglosphere and the sort of champions of this mythology of the west they sort of claim ancient greek ancient greece is belonging to them right you know that that's like that was the, like there was like you know jeffrey and tom and and, and Bobby, oh, walk around in ancient Greece, and right, right. yes, hello, hello, <laughs> you well, know, it uh, blows my mind. One of the things I love in Santok, I don't know enough about the history myself, but you know, you tell a story about, uh, I guess, the Polish kind of place in the world, and you know, really show just how complicated all of this stuff is, and so that was, you know, just a great yeah, passage in yeah. Santok, and. I well, um, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I, I was just like, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge Hannibal Lecter fan. Um, right. You know, I, I'd like <laughs> to sort of, uh, I just, I love Hannibal Lecter. I, I, <laughs> I just, you know, all the books, you know, even the TV series, you know, everything, all the movies. Um, and, you know, it, and, and Memory Palace is basically his superpower. That and a pretty halfway decent sense of smell. That's pretty much it. Right. So you know, so I, I it, that uh, I don't know. In in my fanboy kind of universe, you know, as a nerd, I, I kind of uh, I have memory palaces. It's got a very special place for me. Um, right. Well, I want to hear more about why, but I also really love that you mentioned the Hannibal thing. It connects deeply <clears throat> to something that I've worked on, which is in my PhD, I did friendship and. I talked about Hannibal Lecter as sort of this Aristotelian ideal of the virtuous friend. So even yeah. though he's a horrible person at some level because he's, you know, murdering people, he's got that kind of thing that, that at least in some of the stories, that he's using these skills to teach us a lesson, to knock down some of the snotty people in society. Who, yeah, well, he, you know, he, only they, eats, he only eats the rude. Right, I mean, right. <laughs> he's pretty much no different to any other superhero. You know, except he doesn't just lock them up. But I don't know. Right, right. Arguably, that's more humane, <laughs> just to kill them quick and then eat them afterwards, so he's not wasting any. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 some sort of, That's where that's where he takes you. He takes you to a place where he has you questioning, you know, first principles in your morality. Right, you know, right. to the point where you're digging down and finding there is no first principles <laughs> in morality, and it's right. um. It's absolutely terrifying place to be, but like irresistible. Yeah, I just, I just love it. And um, yeah, you, you need to have uh, a lot of foundational knowledge to be in that space and and walk around in it and um, you know approach his staircase and sort of and I don't know the the sort of knob at the end of the banister starts reciting Ovid at you and all that sort of thing. It's a uh, walk around in Hannibal's head for a bit and um, you know you better bring your A game. 
Yeah, yeah. I kind of like it. I like that rigor. And, um, yeah, and I like that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of, it's almost attractive at the moment when you kind of walk around in the world and the discourse going on, you kind of go like, well, maybe someone should be eating all these rude people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, free range rude, I think you call it. I, I like it. Anyway. You make me think. So, of, yeah, uh, Memory Palace. Well, you make me think a little bit about Georges Bataille, who had the Accursed Share book, where, if I understand it, and I don't know that I do, he was talking about excess value that can't be spent properly. And how that, you know, right. if you have growth and growth and growth and growth, and there isn't a proper redistribution or expenditure of it, it's going to explode. Mm -hmm. It's going to lead to, you know, these kinds of murderous things and wars and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, anyway, it yeah, just comes yeah. comes to mind out of what you're saying there. Yeah. Um, yeah, you get that. That's what scale scale does. Right, right. Yeah. I I kind of don't know where to begin because I'm a little bit confused uh, in terms of oh, I'm not confused, but I tried some of the things you talk about in Sand Talk. So, um, you know, the kinship and uh, what was a story dream, and then ancestor, and mm. then this being the pattern, and you can kind of connect all that stuff and you know that was just yesterday i was reading the book and if that's correct then i memorized it quite well just by using my hand as a i would just default to call it a memory uh, yeah. palace but is that the aboriginal technique or you know how do we well look at so that <laughs> aboriginal technique partially it's um see it differs from memory palace in that it's not an imagined space right you know, so you're using a, a, either a concrete object, you know, that you're actually putting memory into, like a, I don't know, like a external hard drive or something. Um, <clears throat> well, you've got a map of the, you've got the night sky on your screen behind you there. Right. Um, that's a that's a mnemonic. There, you know, you, you, all the stories, laws, every bit of information you can imagine is mapped up on there. That moves with the land seasonally as well. And sort of it's mapped into the landscape as well. So it's it's real places that you either walk in those places um, or you can dream those places or even just um, picture those places and sing your way through them. And so you have that mnemonic. Now, it's kind of, uh, but it's not just that. See, an oral culture is a whole heap of different modalities, not just print. You know, so you have song, you have story. You know, you have those inner maps, those landscapes in your mind, and then they're reflected in the night sky, uh, so you can track them that way. Um, but you kind of, I don't know, if you see much Aboriginal art, uh, you'll see that most of the stuff you'll see is kind of like a bird's eye view of a landscape mm. there. So that that's how you see yourself. So there's that sort of modern idea of I, I think, therefore I am. Uh, but in our way, it's like I'm located, therefore I am. And you see yourself as this sort of node moving around, you know, on a map in a system. You always know where you are in relation to the other nodes around you and, and in relation to the landscape and the direction and the season. So then it's not just place as well. It's also time and time and place are the same thing. Uh, so you're kind of located in, in this time space all the time, like really solidly. Um, you know, because of that, you have access to all that information that you have encoded in those landscapes and also in, you know, mnemonic devices like, you know, objects uh, like uh, message sticks or even everyday objects, the, the things are in there. You know, a woman will weave a basket and she's weaving all her knowledge into it. So when she holds, she has haptic connection that's kind of downloading straight from that and uh, all that knowledge is there. Um, you know, and... <laughs> And look, there, you know, Paleolithic life is very, 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 very complex. Uh, heaps more complex than, than what we have to do today. Right. You know, the, the totemic systems of relations and understanding, you know, entire uh, bioregional systems, you know, down to the tiniest detail. <clears throat> um, constant, um, constant mind games. Um, not mind games, but, you know, like uh, mental acuity sort of games all the time because, you know, most of your work only takes two to three hours a day, so the rest of the day is for ceremony, which is, you know, uh, kind of a uh, 
you know, a psychotechnology as well, where you're connecting with other minds, but you have that, um, you know, you, you're having exercises all the time. So riddling uh, has always been a big thing, uh, you know, particularly in the South, uh, in Australia for tens of thousands of years, you know, lots of like, uh, you know, intellectual exercises, activities, uh, word plays, all these sorts of things, and constantly creating and recreating, um, you know, corroborees, like, you know, um, composing an entire corroboree that goes for seven hours, <laughs> right, right. you know, with it, without a system of writing. So, well, you know, your song makers would do things like that. And then everybody would have to know every step in that corroboree. There's, there are so many things. I can't even begin to touch the edge of how much you need to memorize um, right. as an Aboriginal person. And so, you know, there's a few elements to that. Part of it is a collective mind. So you never doing anything on your own and you're always in relation to someone else and preferably in a group, you know, with all that knowledge and between you, you know it all. Um, you know, so there's that. Um, basically, your mind is not in your, it's not brain bound, but it's in the relational spaces between you and um, other entities. So human and non-human relations that you have, you build your knowledge in those relationships. And so you have your mnemonic devices, your physical objects, uh, you have the night sky, you have uh, place and maps of place um, and being located in that place. You have also have symbols and images. And then you have the classic stuff that, um, you know, people recognize from most oral cultures, including the Homerian um, tradition. You know, you have your rhythm and rhyme and repetition and things like that in how you do it. You know, And you have song and you have all these kinds of things. So the you know, the Aboriginal memory technique thing is um, it's very complex and it's more of a way of life. Mm. So I'm I'm thinking you know for the purposes of the study, uh, how do I take something that takes you twenty years to master? How do I take the most powerful elements of that and cram them into a twenty minute session for some med students? So that we can have some measurable results, right, right. and I think that's one of the one of the limitations of the study. In addition to the ceiling effect, which was horrendous. <laughs> what is a ceiling? Effect? I nearly I nearly cried. I nearly cried when the ceiling effect came out. Oh, we didn't give them enough things to memorize, right. and they were really smart kids because they're med students. They spent their whole life cramming for exams. And they know how to do that. Right. You give them twenty butterfly names to memorize, and half of them are just glancing at the page, going, "Got it." You know, Hannibal Lecter style, you know, <laughs> that expires in three days. Like, you know, <laughs> just looking straight at it and they got it. So, you know, there was a very, you know, a lot of them memorized most of the names and, and retained it, you know, in their, in their working memory for, you know, right through the day. And then even a week later, some of them were coming back and reciting those things. So it's like, ah, so the ceiling effect where there was only a really minimal gap of failure to uh, to measure, and so you know that's a threat to validity right there. You know, um, and so in that tiny gap, we we found that the you know um, the one that drew on the indigenous tradition did slightly better. Right, um, well, and and had some interesting things. It actually it sequenced. <laughs> they were memorized in sequence better. Mm. So when these kids were doing an imaginary space in their mind, mer memory palace. You know, I guess they're free ranging through that memory palace. But when they're doing it, you know, uh, collectively together in the landscape, you know, on a piece of uh, garden, you know, which is also drawn so they know what that looks like as a map and they have a story for it, you know, and, and so it's there's a narrative path through that and there's the, all those language tricks in there. The other language trick was like taboo language. Right. You know, if you if you throw a bit of sex, violence, death in there, people will remember <laughs> it, bros. So yeah. we had yeah. these butterflies doing terrible things to each other and like, you know, and you just sort of throw the word naked in there like three times because, you know, what it's like when people hear the word naked three times then <laughs> they tend to hold that. <laughs> you know, so there's all those uh, sort of little language tricks from our traditions as well. But, I mean, pretty much anywhere where you go in the world, um, you know, like pre, pre-civilization, uh, even with the agricultural communities and stuff like that, you'd see pretty much the same thing in place. Right, right. You know, any sort of pre-literate societies, you, you would see these things in place. 
and you see, you know, when you read, you know, um, Viking sagas, old English stuff, really anything, you can see evidence of these things in there. Um, yeah, like, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think this is a uniquely Antipodean thing. I think this is a human thing, yeah. you know, which is why so much of our memory uh, operates on the mechanics of navigation. And, and of course, you know, story narrative is you know, one of your most powerful memory tools. So you work them in there, of course, they're going to work well. Right. You know? <laughs> and I, I don't know, there, there isn't a, all of the elements of everything I've said about Aboriginal memorization techniques. Um, you will find an equivalent of each of those things, you know, in the memory science. You, you'll find there'll be a method that'll be just that, yeah. you know. Um, you know, but I guess for an entire human uh, memory system, you could propose the idea that, um, you know, there isn't one that's superior over the other, but what you need is a, um, a bit of a combo of all the best elements of each. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I imagine that's what you've been doing as a seeker in this space for many years, going through, you know, gathering little bits and pieces together. I'm trying to, and this is where Sand Talk really inspired me a lot, because one of the problems that you point out is, you know, how that society's pushed out a lot of things in the sa for the sake of words, basically convenience and so forth. So when I started to do this online, I had to choose one word because I'm gonna confuse some robot. If I'm talking about Mary Palace one day, Mind Palace the next day, Journey Method the next day, Roman Room the next day, and yep. you know, if I were gifted at that time to know more about your techniques, Aboriginal memory techniques, and then you know, talking about song lines and like this, the robots are never gonna send me any traffic because I'm forced, I have a pressure upon me that <sighs> I have to pick one thing in order to get statistical relevance of, you know, online traffic to ever go anywhere. Then you have the debt that you talk about uh, in the book as a big problem, which is that students aren't even prepared for the overwhelm of that list of potential names I just gave, right? Yeah. And there's even more. And you just pointed out a bunch yourself, right? And there's going to yeah. be a lot of people who just simply aren't even equipped to pay attention to what we're saying, let alone absorb and, you know, start to talk about the haptic uh, things that you mentioned and you talk yeah. about psychotechnology and so forth. Like there's so much oh, stuff well, going on. There's so much embodiment don't... there, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm doing my best, but I have a... <laughs> I have a, a a gift and a curse, which is that I got to focus in the field, which is yeah. d directed by robots that don't care about us, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or they don't seem to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, look, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe this is the start of, you know, nudging you towards being the one who comes up with a, a unified recall theory or something. You know, I don't believe in the one, except for I, I do believe in a fundamental oneness, but it ain't me. There you, you know? go. Like lights, <laughs> lights, lights on, nobody home. I just Here's the thing. So in our way, you know, you, you, all the stories have to sit together, like in a mosaic pattern, and you move from one to the next. And I once heard Stephen Hawking, I think it was in his book, that Grand Design book, he, he describes science in the same way, is that, you know, there is no unified theory. Mm. And, and and that would take all the usefulness out of science in a way because well, he described it almost like a map, um, you know, where you move from one grid to the next and there's different maths required, you know, or like a patchwork quilt, you know. You move from one theory to the next depending on your context and what you need. So Newton's, Newton's useful, you know, when you're on the ground. But mm. if you want your phone to work, you're going to need a bit of Einstein, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you just switch across, and and that's very much how um how Aboriginal intellectual traditions work. You know, very comfortable with dissonance, right. very comfortable with uh, conflicting stories, even about the same thing, because they don't really conflict. They're um they're just useful in different contexts. You know, um, and I think uh, <laughs> the people who write headlines for um for articles <laughs> uh, could probably use a bit of that. Mm. You know, though, uh, one of the things I tried your exercise in the book where, you know, you teach committing these uh, principles to memory or at least the words and starting to reflect upon it and then squeezing your hand and and squeezing your gut at the same time. And I was thinking and, you know, this is just a thought and I can see my own kind of. Not that I'm a Christian, but I can see like the, the Christian mythos influence yes. on what I'm about to say. So 
I'm not sold on even what I'm about to say, but my thought was there. Uh, in terms of sustainability, what we're doing to ruin the planet and all that sort of stuff, I just thought there's also another story, which is mm. the ant colony of humanity, where mm. there's a bunch of egos who think, yeah, we're doing this and we're doing that. There's even an ego called ant, uh, Elon Musk or Ant Musk, let's call him. Yeah. And Ant Musk has somehow been produced by the ant colony, and he thinks he's going to get us to Mars. And then I was just thinking, you know, are we really ruining the planet or is it true that the sun will die one day? And somehow our species collaborated to get consciousness to another planet and potentially to another one and another one and another one. And so we might look back thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of years from now and think, yeah, we destroyed the earth, but mm. we're here to see what we did. Mm. And so anyway, it's just like a weird thought that came to me as I was doing your exercise. And it's not to, you know, be an alternative to anything but it was just kind of well you, you didn't say much or, didn't say much, or what? <laughs> much uh christian in there except for a general sense of a rapture um well also with, it's with the, the twist of transhumanism and and, and it's kind of <laughs> technotopianism but look um yeah here's the thing bros i don't know i'm i i think any m mystical tradition you know for me that that story's got to be alongside you know, um, I, I haven't seen many that aren't worthy of being alongside right. um, and they need to be all together. It's like that uh, patchwork quilt of theories. It's the same thing when you get into the uh, mysticism. Right. You know? And um, I don't know, for, you know, for the Christian stuff, I, 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 like, I like to look at uh, Bible translation, right. Bible translations in Aboriginal languages right. and see which words people use to translate new concepts. So, like the idea of Holy Ghost, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, um, you know. So, in my family's language, that that translates as um, "Ngan we Goddom," um, and "Ngan we." That's kind of like that big power, that big uh, unseen force, unseen spirit within, you know, and that um, you know, and that you know, that's that same thing when you're doing that thinking, feeling. Uh, thing with your belly when you're, you know, when you're using that, what some people call chi or whatever. Every tradition's got a word for it. That's the same power, you know, and it's the yeah. same thing. It's it's all around and in in everything, you know. It's that spirit. <clears throat> so you know, I don't know. That's that's again we, and like a lot of our a lot of our thinking, you know, if it's sort of unified within you. Not like a unified field theory, <laughs> but when, if your thinking is unified, then a lot of it is feeling. And I don't mean emoting, but it's like what our old people say, you mean when they say feeling, right. you know, like you're feeling for the tree, you know, or you're feeling for that cat, you know, it's that relational connection and all of the embodied um, knowledge and information that's sort of beautifying that space in between you. You know, and, and that, that's where all your cognition sort of is. You know, for us, it's external. It's not contained within you as this special glorious being. You know, it's in your, in your relation. Everything you know, you only know in relation with someone else, you know, not just in relation to them. Right. Um, yeah, so that's there. That's there, and I, I don't see much uh, conflict, you know, with that uh, Christian mystical traditions, uh, you know, Muslim mystical tradition, any of them, you know, everybody's right. got some form of that. <laughs> I, I meant Christian more in the sense of sacrifice and suffer now for heaven later kind of stuff. But I don't mean that I think that there's going to be a heaven or a utopia or anything like that. I mean, <laughs> if creation is what it is, then destruction is created. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's got yeah. to be, it's got to be part of the package maybe. Well, look, you know, like I said, the Bible translation sort of changes things when it moves across languages, and I think that happens a lot. You know. Right, right. So you have that uh, that Bedouin tradition, um, you know, from the Jewish cultures like pre-Egypt, you know, when they were still in that same, they were shepherds, you know, in pretty poor country that had been violently transformed by desertification, you know, and climate change. So they're... You know, and one of the one of the things they had to do to um, sort of re reclaim areas of desert is they'd find like you know a, a patch of uh, sage or something, uh, which meant there was some moisture down there, permanent moisture, 
you know, and they would um, they would leave one sheep there, one lamb, and then that lamb would eat the sage, and then you know uh, through its feces, etc., would enrich the place. So it started to complexify the place. So next year, same season, they come past, and that place is more beautiful. Maybe the lamb's died and its body's gone into that and enriched it, but maybe the lamb's still alive and continues to enrich it. And then birds have come in and dropped seed. And so there's more cover. And then so there's more moisture that's able to come up. And so it's the seed of an oasis. And then maybe things are going so well there, they can leave another lamb there, you know, and then those lambs, are the, those sheep have babies together. And, you know, after, you know, 20, 50 years, you find there's a big oasis in that place because they build it up. But the thing is, um, that first lamb is just going to run off and die in the desert. Right. So they they break its legs. Wow. Yeah, which is you know really hard for a shepherd to do. So they break its legs and make it lay down in that green pasture. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, and st- and stop there. So by the time it heals, it's it's already used to the place and it will stay. Um, and so that's the he maketh me lay down in green pastures thing. Right, okay. It's not like this gentle thing. It's like, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, we need uh, complexity here and we're, you know, we're creations in motion and we're doing it all the time, you know, but, you know, it's not always pleasant. But, uh, you know, sometimes I'm going to have to break your leg, <laughs> boy. <laughs> you, yeah, it's the spirit works like that. So, you know, I, I really appreciate that because that's a, an indigenous kind of Bedouin idea. But when I hear things like the Lord's Prayer and stuff that's been filtered and sanitized through a kind of industrial culture mm. and through a language that's sort of appropriating and sanitizing things, yeah. you know, away from their, um, you know, from that feeling thinking meaning you know um then you find something else yeah translation is tough i mean i think uh better shot better sheep or whatever the opening of the bible is is supposed to be from hebrew it's supposed to be in a beginning a supreme being created a heaven and an earth so it's opening to multiple supreme beings and multiple heavens but they just in the beginning god you know and then the next sentence in the Hebrew is Ruach, which is another god, and then later there's mm. Adonai and yada yada. So yeah. it's like the actual Hebrew is really complex. So Well, so that, I mean, that started out as the people were still mobile, you know, mm. within their territories, um, you know, like uh, so pre, pre-writing, right. you know, so pre-print, you know, that's, that's all an oral text. And, you know, I mean, so prior to Samaria and Hammurabi's code, you didn't have these massive monotheistic deities. You had, uh, you know, these these entities were localized, yeah. and they were attached to places, and those places had story, mm. and those story places were connected up, and you moved between them, and as you moved between them, you told the story, and that's the mnemonic. That's yeah. your memory in the landscape. And you draw these things, and you dance these things, and you story these things, and you sing them, and you see them in the night sky, and this is what we've always done. You know, um, but yeah, when you get to uh, Hammurabi's law, he had to have a uh, supreme deity that could enforce contracts, right? So that he could get people <laughs> to swear to this one vengeful, powerful god. Mm. You know that they wouldn't break their contract. I mean, I guess it was kind of like uh, the first blockchain, but you know, it was like a god chain. <laughs> 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 Interesting. It was like a smart, a smart contract, but like uh, you know, a God contract. You don't want to mess with God, so um, you know you have to deliver. <laughs> and when these conditions are met, you know A, B, and C, then D will happen. You know, um, as, so that's uh, that's how that happened. It was really just for commerce, um, coming out of print and the keeping of records, in an attempt to try and control the future. You know, and it's that desire to control the future um, that was sort of born into civilizations uh, that kind of messed everything up. And even print itself, I mean, it, it changes, it radically rewires your brain in very inefficient ways. And it's not optimal for memory. It's not optimal for cognition or anything. Um, right. yeah, learn, learning to read really messes with your head. It's like even your facial recognition migrates from one side of the brain to the other. 
because there's no room for it over there now because that's doing something else. So (laughs) it's got to go to the other side and sit in a place where it doesn't belong and be very inefficient. You know, um, I keep saying to people if they, you know, I mean, it feels good just to go, you know, oh, racist AIs, you know, when, you, when you're looking at the facial recognition software problems, you know, facial recognition software doesn't recognize black people, you know, for example, as accurately. Um, and it's like, I don't know, it's satisfying to go, ah, oh, well, that AI is racist and it learned it from the racist programmers kind of thing. Um, but you're not going to fix the AI that way. So, I mean, what you need to make sure you've got is that on your software development team, uh, the people who are working on the facial recognition, hardware, software, everything else, um, you want to have some illiterates on your team. <laughs> like you want to get a, a Sudanese refugee, um, you know, <laughs> you want to get him uh, on your team, not because he's black, because you can have as many black face room as you like, but you're all thinking the same way because you're all literate. Right, you, know, right. you, you want to get a fellow who can't read, right, you know, right. a few people who can't read, and you want them there working through the logics of that thing as well uh, because they still have their facial recognition intact. Right. You know, they, they can still do it. They can still memorize thousands of faces and, and find them there. Um, you can't anymore because your brain's been wrecked from uh, your literacy. Right. So, yeah, that's what true diversity is. <laughs> is getting people who actually do think differently um, together. Yeah. Well, that's you know an interesting thing. What what? Hmm. I that, see that fellow. That fellow. He might also uh, understand that. Um, you know, uh, on the coast near you know in his region, that um, you know only white people get stung by jellyfish. So jellyfish can't see pale things, just can't see them, doesn't sense them, but it sees dark things. So it's like, well, and when you dig down and you find that in the facial recognition stuff, the problem is with the sensors, not necessarily with the code. Mm. The sensors aren't, you know, the light isn't bouncing off (laughs) the dark surface properly. So, um, you know, that person might suggest, well, we need to study those jellyfish and do some biomimicry work to figure out um, how the jellyfish sensors work and then how we can incorporate, uh, how we can replicate that technology and incorporate that in with the one that we already have. And then we'll have something that will be able to pick up light off uh, all different kinds of surfaces, um, light reflective and dark, dark reflective surfaces at the same time. You know what I mean? That's what proper diversity is and proper thinking and that's why you need all those different, those different stories all together in one group because right, your right. group memory, your memory as a collective is so much more than your individual memory can be in right. your um, very sexy Hannibal Lecter bloody ancient Greek memory palace, right, right. which, as I say, is really attractive to me. <laughs> <laughs> but well, that's I the, hear, that's I the hear fabulous that. individual in me that longs for that. But, I mean as attractive as any of these techniques are. I mean, how do we do it? How, that I, 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 I've, I'm shy of two, two, maybe three chapters in the book, but I, I went ahead and read the end there. And I just, I hear a story of how you participated in, you know, creating some centers or what I understood to be something ah. like at the state library here in Brisbane, they have hmm. a, like an Aboriginal center there, which I have a story about actually. Um, but it, I mean, it wasn't what you envisioned. So in terms of getting that, that person from, you know, some area where the brain hasn't been dis- destroyed yet into AI, where do we begin actually making that happen? That's, that's, yeah, the, puzzle, that's the tricky know? thing. Yeah, but that's, uh, oh, I guess I'm working on that now. We're setting up a Deacon, uh, an indigenous knowledge systems lab. Mm. And that's, that's very different from just uh, indigenous knowledge. Like a lot of people do indigenous knowledge work and it's about recording the content right. of, uh, you know, indigenous traditions. And that's really important and that's good work to do. Um, right. you know, however, for me, I'm interested in applying indigenous knowledge processes you know, to problems in the world now and to the future problems. Right. So because uh, indigenous methods of inquiry are very good at dealing with complexity. Right. You know, so, um, you know, we've got things that we can bring to the table there. 
you know, so we're we're um, setting up a lab for that now, and then hoping there'll be a lot of uh, sort of copycat knock-on effect ones, and an entirely new industry will be created out of that. Uh, so that's what I'm doing towards it, and you know, so we're just uh, seeding heaps of things, and and we're sharing research right the way through. So for us, in our way, research translation is not something you do at the end of the project. Right. Uh, research translation is a process that starts before you even know what the project is. Right. You're having public and transparent conversations and behaving in that way. And so you're allowing, you know, um, everybody, um, you know, who, who is listening to that, that you're allowing e everybody and anybody to contribute right. uh, to the thinking around that. And that that continues right the way through the project. For us, it continues for like, you know, at least a decade after the project as well, because uh, you're responsible for that thing you put in the world and you're responsible for tracking all of the externalities of that thing and making sure that you're managing it properly. Um, right. You know, so so even there, right from the start, our responsibilities to, um, you know, all the community and all the landscapes and everything else around the world there, you know, particularly if we're having this outwards focus, outwards looking focus, looking out into the world at the problems of the world and seeking to uh, seeking to address those, you know, then that's a big responsibility. So, you know, we take that very seriously. Um, yeah, so I guess that's where you begin. Um, and while also recognizing that these are just human ways of being, these are human ways of being that are pre-industrial and in some cases pre-agricultural. Um, you know, and when you're working like that, you seed things and, and they, they happen. You know, so when uh, this memory article comes out, <clears throat> you know, then that's um, because of the way we're dialoguing publicly uh, with a lot of people like you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that means we're connecting up and it doesn't just become clickbait because we're out there talking about it. And so then all of a sudden there's a whole heap. I think there's three different follow-up studies now. Uh, different universities have asked me to help them out with uh, because they want to try and replicate the results. Uh, but in different ways. So one university is going to be looking at uh, neural imaging technology. Um, and, you know, there's, of course, there'll be funding now too because everyone's talking about it. So, you know, that we're able to afford neural imaging. We're able to, uh, we're able to afford to bring in elders, like Aboriginal elders, to, uh, and take our time so it's not just a 20-minute exercise, right. but that elders are actually inducting you know i mean the poor control group's going to miss out but <laughs> if you're in the other group then you're going to be really inducted into a landscape and um story and knowledge in that place and right. um yeah and we'll be able to see we'll be able to actually see through the brain imaging but also through uh lynn kelly who wrote the memory code i don't know if you ever came across that she's got a second book out now too yeah she's been on the show here twice for both of those books. oh sweet well, that was like uh, when the first book came out. She was on. Uh, she was giving an interview, and someone sent it to me, and said, "Oh, bros, that's your book finished," because I was writing at that stage. This is long before I wrote Sand Talk. That's why there's so much little bits and pieces of memory stuff in Sand Talk, uh, because initially I was writing a book about Aboriginal memorization techniques. Oh, okay. And so, um, you know, someone sent that brother. Look, she scooped you. <laughs> You're finished. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I ended up, I chucked the manuscript out, which is good because it wasn't as good as hers anyway. Um, you know, and and I called her up and said, hey, you scooped me. You know, let, let's have lunch. And so we, you know, we went out for dinner and sat down and had a good laugh and a, and a big yarn. Okay. And uh, she's been trying really hard to set up different labs and institutes and stuff and, um, you know, run into all kinds of problems. Uh, but it looks like that's it's really starting to take off now, and she's looking at doing a really longitudinal study, and so we're partnering up on that now. Um, you know, and we'll see where it takes us. You know, so we've got a, a few different uh, opportunities to replicate these results in a meaningful way now, um, not in a tiny, underfunded, you know, forgotten, um, flawed study uh, that's you know been grabbing headlines lately. Oh, that's fantastic! I mean, yeah. <clears throat> I think it would be the greatest thing in the world because I, I'm very familiar with what Lynn has done and now I'm so glad to have had this clickbait lead to us having this conversation because, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things where 
if you just get started, so many things can can come together, and that's it. It's it's one of these things where, you know, I, I'm quite aware of the challenges, but you know, I, I wonder. I mean, I guess I. I'm just coming to this kind of question where when you talk about recording the stories, recording the knowledge, how how do, is there a paradox between using, I mean, I don't even, I guess the question is how are you recording it? Are you mm. recording it by having uh, Aboriginal people then use the techniques to record it? Or now is it being recorded in words mm. that we know are uh, problems that are on pages I'm not, that... Yeah, I'm not talking about recording the knowledge. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to me, all the um, the research, the, the meaningful research texts are in the research translation uh, right, okay. stuff, the, the oral narratives that run, uh, that start before the research and, and continue long after it. Uh, to me, that's where the reporting goes. Uh, but otherwise, you, you know, you do publish a journal article, but it can only say a certain amount of things. Right. Uh, and that's peer reviewed, so you know that usually gets further sanitized down <laughs> as well. Right, right. So I don't find journal articles to be a peer reviewed journal articles to be a, a very accurate, uh, you know, translation of the research. And really, only 160 people or so is going to read it if the, if it's quite successful. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe um, listen. Okay. So I don't know, but here's the thing: it's like I said, it's not about the content; it's about the process. You know, so there isn't uh, content about indigenous knowledge being recorded. Um, you know, through these studies. That's not it. It's um, indigenous processes are being engaged with. Right. And the uh, physiological and, and other measurable things uh, that come out of that are being measured and those things are being recorded. Um, but as for the actual, you know, um, you know, message sticks and things like that, that's, um, you know, that's just our business. <laughs> right. on the ground you know um we don't need photographs of those in there or we don't need them to be bagged and tagged and uh kept in a museum cellar or something like that or a right. university hung on the wall or whatever well you know one thing that i had talked about with lynn before covid happened and if i'm so lucky to stay in australia i wanted to have people just come to a retreat Mm. And have Lynn there. I didn't know about you at the time, but you know, obviously, if this happens, if we can come, I can. I, after reading Santog, I'm maybe a bit hypersensitive to analyzing myself here, but uh, I can see like problems with you know eco tourism and all this sort of stuff. And you know, if there's a way to get past those problems, you know, I've got an audience, then maybe some people would come, and we could just mm. meet, have a have a an event, and just call it whatever you want but hey mm. at the end of this we're going to have a little showdown we're not going to cut each other and then like equalize our cutting but do you remember what that street was called where you know the library yeah. was and like whoever wins the contest you know gets some kind of well look um, recognition or whatever I, I but think, i'd love to do something yeah like I, I i think um yeah you need to finish the book because i think by the time you finish it those last few chapters um you won't have that sense of um Know, sort of fear and guilt and overstepping and all that sort of thing. Like right. I think, um, I think you know, a, a lot of things in the book, you know, wants to lay all those things out on the table, look at them, and then just go, all right. So what needs? <laughs> right. The idea. I mean, I, I don't find that a lot of that fear and um, and sort of pussyfooting around is 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 very terribly productive or reconciling mm -hmm. or healing or anything else. You know, and we, I mean, we haven't really got time for that. Mm. You know, if we were living in a techno-utopia and we could take our time, then we'd have a couple of centuries to, you know, go through all that sort of stuff and, mm. you know, punish everybody and all that sort of thing. And I, I don't think we've got time for it now. I think uh, mm. things are a bit more dire than that. Um, that feels like the puzzle that we have, though, now. It's like, I mean, you don't want a virtue signal, or maybe you do, but at the same time, like, how do you be sensitive without looking like you're virtue signaling? <laughs> it's just like, it just becomes this ridiculous game, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're right. We don't have time for it. So. Yeah. Yeah, we don't. I, I think it's just, you, you know, I mean, you know, basically stop being afraid of being cancelled. Because the worst thing that's going to happen to you is you'll sell more books or, or you'll get more viewers. Uh, so if you're in any kind of media, then I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I just I just think... Um, you know, I mean, your intent will become pretty clear. You know, if you're out there to try and reclaim some uh, supremacist position, mm. 
you know, while sort of, you know, being a sort of bad actor who's pretending to be, uh, you know, making sense or just being empirical or whatever, then, you know, I think that'll become pretty clear and, um, you know, you'll attract all the assholes and, um, <laughs> and everybody else will probably steer clear of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, 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 it's hard, though, to even exist in this economy without existing in some kind of extractive relation. So, you know, there's, there's going to be a certain amount of that anyway. Mm. And it's a matter of being able to notice it and, um, and you know, and just not freak out too much about it. But notice it and know that's what you're doing. And, um, and then, you know, try and collectively find ways around that. Mm. But we do need to do that collectively. It's, um, that's not individual work you know, in some Puritan tradition of looking inside and constantly examining yourself and finding the sin and purging it and then looking at everyone else around you and, you know, burning that one at the stake and chucking that one in the pond or whatever, <laughs> you know. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, that's a that's a weird uh, cultish sort of behavior there. You know, mm. I think, I think it's, it is a collective effort to, um, you know, to find what's real and find what's useful and, you know, to be able to hear everybody's stories and not just hear them like, oh, I have a voice, but like, you know, um, to actually bring all those stories alongside each other in that big mosaic, you know. Right. Um, and then be able to you know, move between those stories as needed in different contexts. Right. And it's not about social justice. Uh, that one, it's about, you know, just that's how we do. As human beings, that's how we're patterned. It's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thanks for saying that. In terms of everything that you know, we've been talking about, the all indications are that, you know, I think, I think that maybe the 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 clickbait is true. That there can be better. There can be a way to land at something where, if we can bring each other together, it actually can be better. But I still see the debt at the level of the individual, and that's kind of the the problem that I see, and that you point out so well in Santok, which is you know you got you've got this idea in your head that there is an individual, and that's the problem. And I see a lot of what I've been doing in my work as memorizing particular texts that help you dissolve or neutralize the notion of a self or the notion of an ego. That's coming from like ancient oh, Sanskrit nice. stuff. Um, which, uh, you know, <laughs> ego kind of death weird. through data overload. I right, like right, it. right. Uh, yeah, crash you know, I, the system. I crash can, uh, the system if, if you can't find the restart button. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Or, or at least defrag or whatever. But <laughs> nice. at the end of the day, I mean, if I see anything out of this, and I would love your thoughts on it, we can actually have better. And this is something beyond words. I mean, as you pointed out, the words on the page are reforming the brain. And so, you know. We got to use them somehow. It's the trap that we're in. What do you? What are your just general it. closing thoughts on on that? Ah, uh, just we're in a context. You have to be in your context. Mm. Uh, you can't deny. You can't be in denial of the context you're in, and and you do need to uh, make sure you're equipping yourself with the best theories, the best psychotechnologies, not just you know highest quality ones, but the ones that are best suited for your context in that moment and for your purpose. And you do need to be able to, um, you know, draw down and use many tools for that. Right. Um, so yeah, that's that's it. You gotta have a big toolbox, right. very big toolbox, and it doesn't matter. Like, oh, I've got the bloody really superior spanner over here. Well, you're gonna need more than a <laughs> an amazing spanner. You're gonna need all the tools. Right. Well. I will finish San talking. I'm looking forward to that and reviewing it a few times. I've already highlighted a page I would love to quote in my own next book because it really uh, impacted me. But in terms of you know directing people to read that book, where else can you know people follow up if they want to or find more information about what you're doing, and uh, how can I myself you know keep in touch to to uh, spread this further and and accelerate more? Oh, I don't know. I mean, together just keep. <laughs> Keep working with whatever works for you, I guess. Right. Um, you know, I've got no needs around that in terms of marketing. Uh, I don't need to be promoting the book or anything. Um, okay. you know, I'm happy just to be having the yarns with people uh, like yourself. Um, it's just been a privilege, you know, uh, looking at your work and the expertise you have, and you know how long you've been, you know, right across every part of this discipline. It's um, you know, it's 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 a real uh, 
you know, I don't know. It's a it's a bit of a privilege to be able to meet people like you and, and to be able to uh, talk to you face to face like this, and um, you know, <laughs> jump well, around in your mind for a bit. I'm grateful as well, and I I appreciate the privilege of this time and this recording and being able to pass it on to as many people as possible through the strange magic of the internet. So yeah, but whatever you feel feel to do, um, you know, we we haven't got time to stuff around. It's uh, everything's dying, and we've got a couple of decades uh, <laughs> right, right. to sort it out. So we're going to need a lot of minds and a lot of tools, you know, collectively. Cool. Um, I, a lot a lot of diversity happening. Yeah. I uh, hope we can speak again at some point. I hope I'll be staying in Australia, but whether I'm here, there, or the other place, if I can ever do anything, just, you know, it's no worries. and I uh, yep. put whatever yep. power I've got behind whatever. Uh, One of you on, flick us an email. Cool. Do the Skype thing or whatever you want to do, bro. All Sounds right. good to me. Thanks so much, Jason. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It. All right. No worries. Bye. Bye-bye.